Okay. So the only other way that a question is going to be given to you on an AP exam about equilibriums for acids and bases is they tell you how much actually gets dissociated. So instead of giving you um, your Ka value here, they're going to ask you to solve for it by using something called percent dissociation or percent ionization. So remember the two words. Dissociation means things are breaking apart. Ionization means that something is being ionized, which also means something's breaking apart. So in any of these reactions, this dissociated and then this piece ionized. They can use either word. It just means that something is giving up an H+, plus, something's accepting an H+, plus, and here's the amount that it's going to do it. It's going to do it by, uh, like in this question, 0.767%. So when they give you the percent, that's your change. That's the amount that's going to be going away. So if I started with a certain concentration of this, 0.3 molar, 0.767% is going away. It's turning into products. That's what this means when it says percent ionization or dissociation sometimes they might use. So if this part goes away, I can just subtract out that much. That means that my products are going to increase by that much. It's really the same problem, just understanding the vocab. So what do we start with for this? 0.3 molar. What are our initial concentrations on the other side? Zero and zero. I just want to point out that sometimes your products could have an amount to start with. And if they do, you set up your ice chart the same way, and you would just add to it by the time you got to your equilibrium. So if they tell you that there's already some acid in the beaker, you're just going to start with it in your H plus, in your initial line. All right, so now my change is going to be minus x plus x plus x, but we know what the change is, right? So here's going to be the minus x plus x plus x. And then equilibrium shows us that, but we can find x and just plug it in. So 0.3 molar multiplied by my percentage as a decimal. So don't forget to move your decimal place two to the left. This will give me the amount that goes away, which means that that amount gets added to both of your products. Okay, so if this is our x value, now we're going to plug it in, and you're literally going to subtract that out of that 0.3, right? We're not going to eliminate the x in the equilibrium line. We're going to put it in there. So when we solve for it, these are both 2.30 times 10 to the negative third squared. But normally we eliminate this x. We're not eliminating it because it's telling me the value that it is, and it's not negligible. It actually is something that should be subtracted out. So now I subtract that out, I solve for it, and I get my Ka value. So now that we know our Ka, we can find our pH. How do you find pH always? Concentration of H+. Plus. So technically, I didn't really even need my Ka value there to solve for it. I could solve for the pH just directly from the ionization. So if I know my H plus concentration, which we do, we're just going to solve for it by using the negative log of that. So you just throw that in directly. Make sure you pay attention to your number of significant figures in your concentration is how many? So then your decimals and your pH need to be three. I will be giving points for that tomorrow on your quiz in any spot. You don't know when I'll give you the point, but it'll be definitely in there. Ready to go. So here's, we, we can easily do this problem because we did this earlier, and we also, it's the exact same thing as calculating the Ka and the pH and all that for a weak acid, except we're going to flip it to a weak base. So tomorrow on your quiz, this is the one area where students get a little tripped up because you forget to recognize that this is a base. You see how it doesn't say? It's, the question will just read that. It'll say find the pH of this solution. So if you don't recognize this is a base, you're going to start writing, trying to write acid reactions, and that's not going to happen for you. So this is really important that you recognize how to write that. And it's really important that you recognize if it's a one-way arrow or a two-way arrow because you're going to find pH two different ways, right? pH for a strong is direct. Same thing for a strong base, you would find pH, pOH directly. If it's weak, then you have to do KB or KA. All right, so this is a base. It's a weak base, so I'm going to have to solve for KB. So what is your first step? To write your reaction. I'm not writing it for you tomorrow. 
So your first step would be to write your reaction, right? So if you write out your reaction, now you can solve for this problem given the KB or the PKB. You solve for your KB by doing 10 to the negative, right? So 10 to the negative 4.74 gives you your KB value. Same thing that we did for KA, right? One of your clues might be that I gave you a KB value, and then you would say, oh, well, she must be giving me a base. That's a possible clue. But what could I do or the AP exam? I could give you a KA and still ask you to do it for a base. What do you do if I give you a KA and you recognize, hey, this is a base? Not that one. That would be if I gave you a PKA. If I gave you a PKA, then you could do 14 minus the PKA to come up with the PKB. I would do KW. Right, KW is equal to KA times KB. Okay? So just recognize, I don't remember if I do that on your quiz tomorrow, but the AP exam is notorious for giving you weird little setups like that and making sure you know what you need to do. All right, so we solved for KB. Now we're going to do what? KB equals? Any K equals? Products over reactants. And since you already have the reaction, you write that out. And you're going to write your ice chart. We don't know what our final products are, but we do know it's a weak base, so then the denominator is going to be the 3.5, right? And then we have our x squared values. I mean, you don't have to write an ice chart every single time, but they might help you. So the question originally wants to know what the pH is, right? But we're going to have OH concentration, so two approaches. What, you can find POH by doing negative log of this, and then what? Subtract from 14, or if I have OH concentration, KW is equal to H plus times OH concentration, and then you could solve from pH there. I think 14 minus the POH is faster, but it's up to you. So now we know OH, we can solve and then subtract from 14. Make sure you use your decimal places to match your sig figs and your concentration. And then a good check is to recognize that your pH should be in the basic region. If you have a pH below 7, you probably messed up somewhere. And since this isn't a strong base, your pH should not be close to 14. It should be in this range, right? Something between a 13 and a 14 is going to be a strong base. Something that's a strong acid is going to be between like a 0 and a 1.5 maybe. And then weeks are going to fall in sort of any range. All right. So this is the same exact approach that we did with the acids, but now we're just doing it with the bases. So here's another problem. Uh, a 0.15 molar ammonia solution has a pH of 8.75 find the KB. All right, so think about this in your head. If you're finding KB, you're going to do products over reactants. I know this concentration, but I don't know these directly. How am I going to find them? What information in the problem is giving me to find these two? We're not solving for X squared this time, because if I was solving for X squared, it would have been giving me the KB, but I'm finding KB. So I need to know both my numerator and my denominator. So what piece of information? It gives you what? It gives me not OH, it gives me pH. All right, so if I have pH, I can find essentially this OH concentration. So I can subtract this and do POH. 10 to the negative POH would give me this. What about this? Think about all your ice charts that you've been making. This would have been 0.15 minus x, 0.15 minus x. This would have been 0, 0, plus x, plus x, x, x. So if you know what x is, then this is going to be x, right? So think about how you would set up your ice chart. You're essentially just going to find OH concentration from here, which will be the same as this. Because it's a weak base, the concentration of this is not going to change much because it's negligible, the amount that does change. And then just solve numerator divided by denominator to find it. So step one, find your POH. So 14 minus 8.75 gives me 5.25. 
So now we're going to find OH concentration, which is going to be the same as the NH4 because it's X in our ice chart. So 10 to the negative 5.25 gives me 5.6 times 10 to the negative 6. Recognize that you had to go backwards this time. So given the POH as two decimals, then my sig figs and my concentration can only be two sig figs. It's going backwards. So 5.6 times 10 to the negative 6 molar. Okay, so after we find our concentrations, like I said before, we know that the ammonia doesn't change by much. So we can just ignore the change and plug in the concentration directly. So you just plug in all of your values for your numerator denominator. You solve for KB. If it asks you to find KA, you would just do KW is equal to K times KB. Remember, Ks don't have any units, so this answer is acceptable. Okay, moving along. So this is just a little bit of theory, really fast. Anything that can donate more than 1H plus is called a polyprotic acid. So polyprotic acid uh, can be an H2, an H3, probably not an H4, but usually it's an H2 or H3. Like, for example, carbonic acid is H2CO3. That can donate two H pluses. Sulfuric acid can donate two H pluses. Um, phosphoric acid, that's H3PO4, can donate three H pluses. So every H plus that can be donated has its own K value because K tells you how much H plus is going to be ionized or dissociated. So for these examples here, both of those H's are going to go away. But we always assume that the first K value is going to be the strongest dissociation or the one that dissociates most of the H+. So take, for example, carbonic acid. This first dissociation goes to this. And I just want to point out that sometimes the AP exam will tell you they have, they're giving you a polyprotic acid, but they don't actually give it to you. They will just do something like this, H2A. Right? It'll say the following polyprotic acid has a Ka value of blah, blah, and they just put an A. So it doesn't really matter what it is. You just have to recognize that you're looking at the Ka values. So this first association gives you off this first hydrogen. So you don't remove both of them. You just remove one of them. And it's a double way arrow here because carbonic acid is not as strong. Now, if this were sulfuric acid, we would still one way arrow it and take off both H pluses. Okay? So H plus, and then this is the second acid, so you're going to write it as a second dissociation. So you only remove one acid at a time, hence the one next to the Ka1. So this dissociation is stronger than this one. This is my second dissociation in which it takes off the, the second H plus. So when we do our calculations, even if it's for a weak acid that has two uh, hydrogens, we always take the value to do all of our calculations from the first acid. They may give you two of them, but you're going to do it for this first one. Okay? And I just want to point out, when we did equilibrium a long time ago, we could come up sometimes with like a final reaction, not given these two, but say we wanted to come up with a final one. If you're f coming up with a final K value, you multiply Ka1 times Ka2. Like kind of like a Hess's law where you cancel things out and you come up with a final equation. It's not for this one, but if it did, just so you remember, to come up with new K values, you multiply them. So Ka times Ka1. Uh, and this is what I just said before. Always use Ka1 to calculate H plus and pH. Most of the H plus ions come from the first dissociation. The H plus ions from the first dissociation drive the equilibrium for the other dissociations to the left. So let me just show you what that means for this. If I have first this H plus comes off, what it's saying is that you have a common ion here. And remember common ion effect, according to Le Chatier's, if this is the second reaction, is going to shift this one left. So the idea is the amount of H plus that's coming off from the second reaction is so insignificant that we're sort of just going to ignore it because it drives it even further to the left. And that's a really, really small value. So that's what it means by uh, it's going to shift the second reaction to the left due to common ion. All right, so that's it. So we're going to practice some of your problems now.